Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar, Human Exposure Research in a Cyclical Industry, Noise from Unconventional Oil and Gas Development. I'm Anna Rosowski. I'm a staff scientist at AGI Energy. We have an exciting agenda today. We have with three speakers, Justin Casey from Pasket, Patching Associates Acoustical Engineering, who will be discussing noise emissions from unconventional energy development. Tori Oyama from Ryerson University of Canada, who will be discussing environmental noise exposure assessment. And Lisa McKenzie from University of Colorado, who will be discussing community noise exposure near oil and gas well sites. And those will be followed by a panel discussion with question and answers. Some logistics, all attendees are muted with no audio for the duration of the webinar. If you have questions for the speakers, please submit them via the Q&A function, which you can find on the bottom of your screen. You can also upvote questions from other participants that match your own question. This webinar will be recorded and posted on our website in the next few weeks. If you experience any logistical difficulties, please send a message to the panelists in the chat box. There'll be a post-webinar survey that pops, on your, pops up on your screen. Please post it, please um, fill it out. We really appreciate your feedback. So for those of you who are not familiar with HEI Energy, we're an independent nonprofit corporation chartered to provide pol policy relevant science um, that's impartial and high quality. We're funded jointly by government and the oil and natural gas industry and occasionally by private foundations. We fund research that is selected, conducted, overseen, and reviewed independently of those sponsors. The program is overseen by the Energy Research Committee, which is comprised of an internationally recognized expert, experts in one or more topics relevant to the program. And so with that, I'll stop, I'll stop sharing my screen and introduce our first speaker, Justin. Justin Kayski is a managing partner and principal acoustical engineer at Patching Associates Acoustical Engineering, which is an acoustical consultancy that brings established and innovative best practices for noise management across the energy, transportation, and building sectors. For the past 18 years, Justin has provided noise and acoustics consulting services to the energy and resources sector. His expertise spans all aspects of acoustical engineering, field data collection, compliant investigations, in noise mitigation design, regional planning, and regulation development. Thanks, Justin. Thank you, Anna. Can you hear me okay? We can, yeah. Great. Um, welcome, and thank you ha for having me. Looking forward to sharing some of our experience with uh, noise emissions. Uh, from our perspective and also hearing from the other panelists to follow and hopefully hearing some uh, some questions at the end during our uh, from our attendees today. So with that, I'll, I'll get uh, into the presentation. Um, here to talk about noise emissions in unconventional energy development, specifically at, um, the presentation is geared towards giving some examples of how data can be leveraged uh, to uh, facilitate innovations in mitigation. So fairly simple. Uh, straightforward agenda today, focus a little, spend some time at the start on sound and noise fundamentals. Then we'll talk about some emissions uh, typical for the unconventional oil and gas industry uh, and some mitigation. So this part, uh, the, the sound noise and sound fundamentals, it may be a touch drive. I'll spend a little bit of time on it because it has implications for how sound is perceived um, by humans and also how sound is mitigated um, as we look towards mitigation. So, and there's some more specific examples based on this foundation. Start off with what is sound? So sound, um, pressure fluctuations in the air um, being that is emitted by some surface or vibrating surfaces. So the surface vibrates, it causes the air to vibrate around that surface and the, the, those pressure fluctuations in the air propagate towards a receiver. And that receiver is then uh, ex experienced the sound um, in their ear. A few other components, there's two main factors when we're talking about measuring sound or describing sound. One is how loud sound is. That's generally um, described as decibels. It's a measure of how big the pressure vibrations are. So how the magnitude of the vibrations. And the other factor that's really important is the character or the pitch, or sometimes it's described as frequency. And that's how many vibrations there are in every second. So high frequency would have a lot of vibrations every second. Low frequency would have uh, fewer vibrations every second. Sound 
and noise are generally used in an interchangeable way. Um, as acoustical engineers, we we apply a, we differentiate between the two. The definition that we use is noise is sound or sounds that are unwanted. And there's kind of two components to that the sound component is described by physics. It's described. Uh, it's something that's physical, mechanical. It's uh, it's can be modeled, measured uh, with instruments or computers. And that's where we apply a lot of our engineering science to. The other aspect is the unwanted aspect. And that's more on the human side of things. And that's one, one really cool thing about, about the work that we do is it's, it's a mixture between the physics and also the human perception of it. A lot to do with expectations, perceptions. An example I, I, I think of actually from my childhood is that birds produce sound um and um depending who you are you have a different um feeling for what the what the sound or how you whether you not you like the bird sounds the example i think of is magpies um magpies produce sound but when magpies produce sound early in the morning i describe them as noise because i don't want them but it just depends on the time of day it depends on the person it depends on the perception so we'll use those terms i'll use those terms interchangeably but there is a there is a difference in that from our perspective as we get into a little bit more into the theory, uh, there's oftentimes sound is described as DBA or DBC. They're kind of common measurement uh, ways or describing sound as a single number. Our ears, and on the left side, the right side of the screen is, uh, is a, a noise thermometer. People have probably seen that before, it kind of as a way to describe different sounds relative to each other. Our ears are incredibly good at experiencing the tiniest whisper all the way up to a very loud jet engine. And we've got a large range of, of hearing. Um, our ears are also capable of hearing different frequencies. So on the left side of the screen is, is it's just a graph. I'll get to an example in a sec. Um, early on when, when, when scientists started to measure sound, they realized that people react differently to different frequencies. So in order to one, create the electronic equipment in the early part of the century to try to measure these sounds and also to, to start to correlate that uh, that effect, the different frequencies effect, they created different weighting, theoretical weighting networks. Um, and uh, I'll show some examples on the next slide, is a way to, to kind of take that human response in different frequencies and boil it down to single numbers. Lots were created. DBA and DBC are the ones, the main ones that's kind of survived to today. And they're a way of taking that overall human experience to noise and boiling it down to a single number that can be discussed and talked about and, and um, analyzed. I've got a few examples here. So on the screen is a sound measurements um, from a, it was a workover ray in, in Australia. And it shows the sound is described in three different weighting scales. The top one, the orange one, is the is the, represents the actual pressure fluctuations in each frequency band that was experienced by the sound meter. So that was measured by the sound meter by the sound meter's ears, I guess, and that's measuring the actual size of the sound waves. The dotted yellow line is the same sound but just applied to the DBC weighting network, and then the dotted green line is the same sound again but applied to the DBA weighting network. What it's intended to show is that DBA um, has less, uh, I guess, cares less about the low frequency sound. It's more designed for the for typical human response to um, hearing, or sorry, to uh, speech and that type of work. Whereas the DBC is geared towards the lower frequencies, and DBZ is what the sound meter, the actual instrument, sees. Highlights the difference. If we look at the exact same sound, if we measure it on, on the, the way the sound meter sees it, it's 83.7 dBZ. If we measure it based on this, the theoretical dBC weighting scale, it's 82.4. And if we measure it on the dBA weighting scale, it's 72.8. So it really matters when we're, we're, we're comparing different sound sources, which weighting network we're using. Um, another further example is, of that is, is comparing kind of two different noise sources that have the identical um, um, sound level on a DBC scale. So what we see on the left side of the screen is the wind driven. This is the sound that was measured uh, for typical wind noise. Wind has a lot of low frequency noise and that resulted in a DBC rating of 60 DBC. And on the right side of the screen is uh, a, a facility, I think it was a hydraulic fracturing operation. And that's also 60 dBC. 
but it's got completely different frequency makeup. So we can say that both sources have, both noise sources have a DBC rating of 60 DBC. But if we look at the actual frequency components, uh, it's like comparing apples to oranges. They're, they're vastly different. So it's the reason it, I, I spend a little bit of time here is because how people perceive sound isn't based on one single number. It's based on um, the individual frequency bands and also um, how sound is mitigated is highly dependent on, on frequency distribution. High frequency sounds are easier to mitigate than low frequency sounds. Um, and low frequency sounds are more difficult to mitigate and they require different methodologies. That's the frequency bit. Um, and uh, just to kind of set it, I kind of paint a picture of it. What I've got on the screen here is a, is a measurements. It's like a snapshot in time based on measured values of a hydraulic uh, fracturing operation. And the sound, what's, in, what's showing on the screen is different sound levels. So the, the hotter spots, the yellows and the oranges and the reds pretty represent higher sound levels. And I'm gonna play a movie and it's, it'll show this, the frequency distribution. So when we go from really low frequency sound, so this is what's on the screen now is a, is a picture, basically a picture of the sound being emitted at the very low end of the human hearing perception, 16 Hertz. And it'll scroll through to the mid range and it just shows that different sources or the sound is coming from different areas of the facility of the operation, depending on the frequency. So I'll play, play um, it kind of just walks through Through the mid part of the movie, we see some hot spots to the south end or to the bottom end, and then we see, and then later on in the movie, uh, we see some hot spots towards the other side um, or towards the top end. And it, this stuff matters where the frequencies and where the sounds are coming from matters when we're designing uh, mitigation. The last concept in fundamentals is um, so we talked about frequency. Through experience, we also find that the sound emissions and the sound being received at um, receivers fluctuates a lot over time. So I've got a graph here. There's quite a bit of information on it, but I'll highlight two specific parts here. The top line is the sound level measured at the fence line or the lease edge of, a, of an operation. I believe this is a pumping operation. We see sound level goes up for pumping cycles, and then it goes back down between pumping cycles. The bottom graph is a sound level that's measured at a receiver a few hundred meters away. So we see it's you know in the 70s at the fence line and we see it's in the 40s at the residence uh, further away. Um, I'll highlight one section here. So sound was kind of neat and it worked really, it was, was, it was kind of did what it was supposed to. We would see the sound level at the facility correlate well with the sound level at the residence. So they should kind of work in step. The sound level at the facility goes up, the sound level at the residence goes up. And that's what we kind of expect to see. I'll highlight another section. So that's one pump cycle, the blue, the blue area. The orange area is, is just the time previous to that. So three hours, four hours earlier. And we see the sound level at the residence does not correlate well with the sound level at the facility. And the difference between the two is environmental effects. So through, through measurements, we find that environmental propagation affects the sound by plus or minus 10 to 15 decibels. It's a very large factor as far as how sound is, how sound is uh, propagated and also how sound is perceived uh, by people uh, living around oil and gas operations. Okay, so that's that's the fundamentals. The noise emissions so go through a few sources and then into mitigation. Um, in general, uh, on the screen is a, a well pad, a typical well pad for a for a unconventional uh, oil and gas uh, activity. You see some noise uh, and the 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 relative size of each each block is is intended to represent the kind of how much sound emissions. And then the duration as well as the length of it. So we see site prep, uh, it's typically some mobile equipment. And then we see drilling, which is there for, for a little bit longer, uh, but it and also produces a little bit more noise. And then we see that a lot of the noise impact is coming from the completions operations. Um, shorter duration, um, but more, more um, noise emissions, uh, a little bit more complex. And then we see milling and testing, which tends to be, and it milling and testing can be quite variable depending on the, the specific play. Um, 
in both magnitude and duration. And then it finishes off with production, which is uh, ongoing, but tends to be the, the, lower, the lower noise emissions part of the operation. It's fairly relative. Um, each one of those has been studied and there's, there's kind of values in each one of those. Um, Within each one of those operations, there's there's many noise sources. I'll talk about a few um, kind of at a high level uh, today. Most of the, a lot of the noise is caused by uh, major noise sources, which is engine driven equipment. Um, so there's engine exhausts, it's like on a vehicle, there's the engines producing uh, thousands of, of explosions and that, that sound energy is being transmitted to the air. The engine casing where they, the side of the engine, the side of all the mechanical equipment is vibrating, causing the air to vibrate and, and propagate. And then cooler fans as well as a fairly large source of, of noise, um, major noise uh, source of noise where the cooler fan is designed to take the heat away from the engine or just like a computer, the cooling fan is, is designed to take the heat away from the computer so that it functions similar for an engine or a car. And then uh, other mi minor noise sources, mobile equipment, loaders, track hose, uh, valves, uh, piping, um, electric motors and pumps and sand systems can also be uh, some minor noise sources. This is a pretty short, brief list. There's a lot of noise sources and there's quite a bit of complexity there, but these are the major categories. I highlight them so we can go a little bit deeper into the engines and uh, engine exhausts and cooler fans. So I've got on the screen, uh, some examples of engine uh, mufflers or silencers. Those aren't technically the noise source. The noise source is the actual engine itself producing energy. Um, and a silencer, the, the pictures on the screen are, are actually ways to mitigate energy. And I highlight here a few different, different types of, of uh, silencers. There's a lot of different types, a lot of different technology designed for different weights, pressure drops. It has this type of silencer that's put on really has an effect on um, performance of the engine. So how much, how much work it can do. So there's, there's a lot of science that goes into that, but in general, there's, there's quite a large range of silencers, exhausts, and uh, depending on what's installed, can have a very variable um, noise emissions. Other major, uh, another uh, kind of uh, major noise source are Cooler fans. So the cooler fans are essential for, for the equipment to operate. Um, and um, with production or permanent facilities, which you see on the left hand side, um, there's a little bit of luxury because this space, we don't have space constraints, so we can put larger fans on. Whereas there's the other two examples are smaller fans where we have um, space constraints. So with cooler fans, the most important thing is. They're, the purpose of those fans um, are to uh, cool the en en engine so it performs and also doesn't overheat. But the, the factor that affects noise emissions is the tip speed. So the, how fast that fan can spin to produce the air flow. Um, if we have a faster fan, it's a louder fan. If we have a slower fan, it's a much quieter fan. So when we're space constrained and we have to have equipment portable, um, it, it creates a limitation for how quiet a fan can get for a portable facility versus a permanent facility. I've got another example on that later. Last one for, mitig or so for noise sources is engine casing. So on the right, we see a, a kind of a, an acoustic image of, of a, the side of an engine, We're seeing that a lot of the sound is concentrated um, and this tends to be higher frequency sound concentrated at the in engine casing. There's a component, two components of, of engine casing sound or as a source. One is the sound coming from the engine being emitted as air into the air. Um, and the other component is the engine itself is vibrating. Just like when we're sitting in a car, we can feel the engine vibrate. And those vibrations are transmitting through whatever structure the engine is attached to. So on the, on the cartoon on, this, on the left side, it's, a, it's, a, it's an actual building. And that's an also an, um, uh, a, a noise source that those vibrations um, are also a noise source. Get into some mitigation opportunities. And um, there's two there's two main choices when we look at noise mitigation. One is path-based and the other is source-based. So path-based noise mitigation involves adding 
noise control between the source and the receiver. So these are things like when we put uh, a silencer on um, or when we take a, add an enclosure to a, a piece of equipment um, in, in, in a vehicle will be add, add the hood, add all the equipment or the, the sound dampening inside of the engine compartment. Um, and then noise barriers are also an example where we put something between the sound source and the receiver. Source-based noise mitigation is when we actually find ways to make the source of the sound quieter. So examples of that would be to slow down an engine. If, if a car engine is quieter when we don't, when the engine RPM is lower, other examples are a definite um, good example of slowing a fan down. Electrification is another example where we reduce the amount of sound that's being emitted into the atmosphere altogether. And that has some fairly large implications as far as performance goes. I'm just new about a minute left. Thanks a lot. Supportability, a few examples. I, I think I touched on these. Left-hand side of the screen is, you can see a per, it's, a, it's an exhaust silencer that it's possible to, to design exhaust silencers. So they're, they're quite quiet. They produce a lot of mitigation. To do that, we need a lot of size. So we see a person standing beside a, a, an exhaust silencer. When we look at mobile equipment, especially for well site activities, um, it's, it's impossible to have this much uh, silencing on a piece of equipment. It just makes it so that either it's not portable anymore or else it would require so much more impact, so many more vehicles and trucks going to and from the site that it's, it's a balancing point. Uh, the other one I wanna highlight is on the top right hand side. So this is an aerial view of, of a typical cooler fan for portable equipment. And the current technology is the cooler fans are at the limit for what's portable, what's what can be driven down the roadway. And that comes right into direct kind of conflict or balance with how much quieter the fans can get because we can't make the fans any larger to make them quieter and still have the same amount of airflow. Um, moist walls just like when light enters a swimming pool and the light bends, the same thing happens with sound. Um, when there's an upper atmosphere wind, um, there's a, the sound or the wind velocity near the ground is at zero. And this is a very common effect. So what happens in those conditions is sound bends, refracts, and we see that happening with noise barriers where it creates a great noise barriers can work really good close by when there's in the shadow zone, but at further distances away where we're trying to kind of mitigate sound for receivers, distant receivers, um, under those downwind conditions, sound bends down and it reduces the effect of the noise barrier. So they work well, just have to be, the geometry is very sensitive. And then finally, um, the key to all the mitigation, what we found in our, through our experience, the key to mitigation is understanding where the sound is being produced and how it's being, um, Propagate, how it's propagating through environment. The cool thing is that technology through the through the 90s, 2000s, and into now has really advanced a lot on the on the the analysis side of things, so the data acquisition side of things. And with that data, um, uh, equipment suppliers are able to create a, a a cycle of continuous innovation or continuous improvement. In the production facilities, especially in the Canadian context, we saw that evolution happen through the through the compression industry uh, through the 90s and 2000s, and we're starting to see that happen. Companies are understanding where the sound is coming from specifically because of, of advances in technology. They're able to start making it a dent in uh, mitigation. It's a slow process. What we think is a, a way to accelerate it is to leverage the data that's available and to start sharing some of that data. Um, so on the left side of the screen is a, just a, a representation of seven different mufflers, seven different exhaust sound, exhaust silence that were measured on uh, completions equipment. And we see that just within those seven, there's a range of about 20 decibels sound level. And if companies can start to understand that and share the data, share those insights with each other as they work through their best practices to mitigate this risk, um, we can accelerate that kind of evolution that we saw in the, in the compression industry with mobile equipment. Now that's it. Um, I've got a wish list. I think maybe this might come out as questions, um, but the high levels are really curious i'd uh, love to love to see if there's opportunities to research how sound and annoyance are related um i think there's some there's some um especially from a planning perspective 
And a lot of the studies that were, were built, um, I think were based on kind of older sound measurement techniques and equipment where we had to stick with single numbers. But if we can look at, at full frequency, full data sets, uh, that would be very valuable, I believe. And then uh, in, on the environmental propagation side of things, it would be a pretty large benefit to do some uh, larger scale validation studies because of that environmental condition change. Um, those are the kind of wish lists from a acoustical engineer perspective. I think that's it. Uh, stop sharing now. Great, thank you. So we'll um, move on to our next speaker, um, Tor Oyamo. Dr. Oyama is an assistant professor in the Department of Geograph Geography and Environmental Studies at Ryerson University. His current research in environmental health geography focuses on exposure assessment through the development of environmental models of noise and air quality, novel population exposure metrics, and simulation, simulation systems to assess health impacts of urban change. These efforts complement research activities that aim to further our understanding of environmental determinants of health, as well as health and disease risk in vulnerable urban populations. Thank you, Tor. Okay. Thank you, Anna. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen and hear me uh, well. We can, yeah. Okay, good. And uh, thank you, Justin, for that uh, overview and uh, very sort of direct and practical introduction to uh, oil and gas operation uh, and, and associated noise issues. I'm, uh, I should, should emphasize, and I guess as a, uh, right off the top, I don't really do work in that particular area uh, at all. So I'm really just here to provide a, a more broad overview of uh, how we've come to understand and how we currently do research within environmental noise in terms of both uh, the noise exposure assessment piece. And then uh, I'll, I'll kind of give you a very, very brief update on where we stand with respect to uh, health effects these days. So. Uh, brief history, uh, some, some details on how we do noise modeling and exposure assessment for, for health research, how we link uh, these, these with health data, and then again, what some of the health effects and pathways are. So linkages or, or concerns, I guess, about health, uh, if not health, at least well-being and noise are not new. Um, they go back hundreds of years, actually, but I think the, the strand we can hang on to now at least goes back to the early 1900s and New York was then and continues to be actually one of the leading jurisdictions in, in terms of uh, addressing and and uh, and providing reg regulation and, and just monitoring environmental noise. So traffic was really uh, then as is still today one of those main main concerns and then a whole lot of other uh and interesting sources of noise that they had collected through their surveys in the 1920s like uh, peddlers and, and loiterers may not be the same concern today but nonetheless they started a strand that continues today so into the mid-century uh with development of more uh, sophisticated equipment like the sound sound level meters and, and ability to to log data additionally uh, as justin talked about um having more more ability to, to look at different time weightings and frequency uh, weightings was important. Uh, once we get into the 60s through the 70s, 80s, a lot of the foundations for research that we continue today in terms of looking at health effects, uh, both in laboratory studies as well as population uh, studies through surveys and environmental noise monitoring were really initiated. And again, the foundation uh, what we still do was laid there, and then uh, I guess the, the modern and contemporary stand of how we strand of how we do things uh, started in the eight, 80s um, and, and developed a lot throughout the 90s and, and continually through the 2000s in terms of technology uh, and really the ability to to assess and understand uh, noise on a much larger scale through the environment, which gave us the power to uh, link this to people and of course have more more power in, in the type of studies. Uh, studies that we do. Also in the 80s and 90s is when we see different jurisdictions, uh, at least with reference to traffic, which is what ends up being most most of uh, um, what, what I study in terms of health effects, uh, those, those definitions being defined. So when I say model standards, standards I really mean uh, how different jurisdictions define how much noise a, a car produces or a truck or, or a light commercial vehicle, for example. So this isn't the same 
uh, in, in, in uh, the US as it is, for example, in different European countries or uh, now as actually the entire European region has started moving towards a, a shared model framework where they all define uh, at least transportation sources similarly just to streamline and, and make more common uh, better comparisons between studies. So uh, neighborhood monitoring was at least uh, the dominant type type of way we collect the data. You you put up a monitor uh, in, in an area and basically assign that noise level to uh, people that lived nearby that monitoring site. Uh, then moved on to uh, being able to, I guess, and 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 uh, needing to monitor noise more individually. So either giving people dosimeters or uh, at least has the the. the Research on nighttime noise has been a really um, important aspect of this research. So putting just these type of stationary noise noise meters in or outside people's houses. Uh, then we moved on to, like I said, in the 80s and 90s, these modeling methods, which have much more power, I guess, in, in their ability to define uh, noise levels uh, specifically, but uh, depend on being very um, having a lot of information and detail about the environment uh, within that noise is produced and propagated. So uh, this, this graph on the upper right shows basically the different ways noise can be, or sound can be produced and propagated throughout the environment, reflect uh, and, and reach that receiver, which we uh, perhaps to, to a limiting extent uh, assume to be the facade of, of people's residences. And that's usually the noise level that we assign uh, people. And then um, lately, there's also been some developments in, in sort of combining both um, monitoring and modeling approaches. So I call them, I differentiate them by, we call them deterministic and probabilistic. Uh, and, and that map on the bottom right is just an example of something I did in Toronto where we uh, sort of tried to, tried to use both those types of data set and, and refine a bit more information about uh, noise levels and sources at a really big scale. So this source specific modeling, um, like I said, is, is really the, 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 main, the main method that we use now. And, and um, it's very resource demanding, which is, um, which is a challenge, but it provides really high specificity and provides, for example, uh, noise levels uh, by, by height of building. So this is an example of some, something I did in Toronto again, where you can basically assign noise level basically at the apartment uh, window that someone might be be living in in a, a big city with with a lot of uh, density and high buildings like that. It's possible for all sources. Uh, we we mostly do it for traffic, but it can be done for rail, uh, air traffic, also for uh, any type of stationary source for which the the, the noise or the sound has actually been defined. Um, why do we do it for individual sources? Uh, this is perhaps a problem, but also uh, an advantage. Uh, we have found that different noise sources do actually uh, produce different types and, and, and levels of annoyance. Um, so this is looking at air, road, and rail, and without going into to the detail uh, of them, you can see that the curve, so the, the corresponding percentage of people annoyed, depending on the noise level, so these are uh, basically low, uh, high and very high percentage of people uh, highly annoyed you see that it's steeper uh, and higher for air so the, the annoyance goes is higher relatively speaking at the same sound exposure level for air uh, than for road than for rail so we, we think at least that it's valuable to to look at noise sources individually when we do this research for uh, to try to determine health effects some limitations then we do have different standards by jurisdiction as i mentioned uh, understanding long-term changes in noise exposure levels is, is challenging still because we don't have a lot of historical data. And then as Justin uh, alluded to, understanding how different parts of the frequency band might affect people's responses and health uh, is really uh, quite uh, out of the current bounds of research, I guess. Uh, so just to, to summarize that. Um, we, we can do it by group, we can do it individually, and we have some temporal and spatial challenges with assessment at residences. So some of the methods that we use to, to actually understand the health effects then uh, are through surveys or uh, why there's been a really explosion of, of health 
uh, evidence lately is because of uh, development of a lot of health cohorts and registries throughout the 90s and 2000s that now provide us long-term uh, understanding of, of people's exposure and potential health, health effects. Uh, and then also over the last number, few decades, really, there's also been a, a significant increase in the use of physiological measurements and medical records uh, and linking those to exposures like blood pressure and more recently uh, RNA and protein assays and, and getting very detailed information about pathways of inflammation and, and the actual biochemical reactions that happen uh, in our bodies. So I won't go through this in, in detail because I'm, I'm towards the end of my time here, but just, uh, I guess, you know, as an overview, you know, we do, we do now have a pretty good and firm understanding of the pathways that lead to health outcomes uh, when we are exposed to noise and, and uh, dividing those then between high and low sound level exposures, hearing loss, of course, a very well known effect that was identified back in the 1800s. Uh, and then other effects uh, commonly observed being annoyance, cardiovascular uh, annoyance and cardiovascular outcomes and, and sleep disturbance uh, are the ones that we really uh, tend, tend to focus on and have quite a bit of evidence for now. Uh, this is just uh, a summary of, of uh, and quite a bit of information, but if I could just point you towards these couple of columns here, th these are really the outcomes and the evidence for which there are now uh, really strong or high levels of ed evidence. Uh, so for, for road and aircraft uh, noise related to stroke, coronary heart disease uh, and, and exposure from road traffic is, is the one we're, we're by far the most confident about. Uh, and then depression and anxiety, uh, other or cognitive disturbances or, or outcomes, of course, and then sleep disturbance. And then uh, the noise levels at which we generally start seeing health effects around mid mid 50s for road and rail and, and a bit uh, lower for aircraft noise. So uh, an important consideration when, when looking at specific industries and the types of noise they produce. And then finally, uh, where perhaps people like me and Justin start uh, sh sharing interests again or, or in assessments on a larger or assessment in terms of population exposure and what's becoming the norm now are these strategic noise mapping methods where we're thinking more about the proportion of people exposed to high or exceeding levels rather than sort of defining average uh, noise levels as that has a lot less uh, less value. So perhaps the proportion of population at high, high risk of certain diseases uh, or uh, those above thresholds uh, like defined by the WHO. Okay, I'll end there. Thank you, Tor. Um, Okay, so we're going to move on to Lisa now. Um, Lisa McKenzie is an assistant professor of environmental and occupational health at the Colorado School of Public Health at University of Colorado, Denver. An environmental epidemiologist by training, Dr. McKenzie's research focuses on the impacts of environmental stressors and interventions and health outcomes. Her research has contributed to the understanding of how exposures resulting from the development of oil and gas resources affect public, the public's health. Thanks, Lisa. Pardon me, I didn't get myself um, unmuted, so I have to start this over again. Okay, can you see my screen and hear me okay? We can, thanks. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you to uh, Tor and Justin, those are really great presentations and thank you to HEI, I really appreciate the opportunity to um, share some of these findings with everyone. So what I'm gonna be discussing is um, information that we've gathered, not, or we and other researchers have gathered on noise around oil and gas sites. And I'm gonna start by summarizing some of the information we have on noise complaints from residents living around the sites. Then I'll move into measurements of noise that have been made around oil and gas sites in several states that may be relevant to residential exposures. And I'm going to put this into the context of how many times or the percentage of time this noise exceeds health-based 
um, thresholds and um, talk a little bit about characterizing the noise near the oil and gas sites. So to um, begin, um, the, this slide is showing noise complaints around oil and gas sites in Colorado over the years. And uh, the first takeaway here is people are complaining around about noise when oil and gas is near them. Some people are anyway. And the other thing I want you to take away from this is the, um, the increase in noise complaints over the years. Um, by 2017, there was more than one noise compl complaint being made to our state regulator per day. And the noise complaints um, range from things like the noise is continuous, um, people reporting that their houses are vibrating or perceiving that, and a lot of complaints about disturbance to sleep and the sense of being wronged or some outrage about the noise. There have also been a couple studies in Pennsylvania where they've um, interviewed people. One of the studies they interviewed people about living near an oil and gas sites and 45% of those respondents reported noise as a stressor. The other study in Pennsylvania, 70% um, of 23 people reported that the noise from oil and gas sites around their homes was extremely bothersome and they considered that noise to be damaging to their health. And one thing I want you to notice here is the bothersome complaints were coming from people up to more than a mile from the sites. One respondent in this study expressed that the, the noise from the oil and gas site was the loudest noise they had ever experienced. However, a couple other respondents indicated that the noise was not very loud. So there's a range of perceptions about the noise. And then in a, a more recent um, compilation of complaints, um, Dr. Wiesner at the city and county of Broomfield Department of Public Health um, pulled complaints about noise concerning health from 540 complaints that were registered with her department during the development of an 18 well site with a sound wall in place using an electric drill rig um, that occurred in uh, between November 19 and June 2020. And on this figure, this um, rectangle is the site and the darker colors here are indicating where there were the most health complaints concerning noise, lighter colors uh, indicating fewer. I wanna draw your attention to the scale here. And you can see that more than a mile from the site, there were a few people uh, reporting that the noise was affecting their health. And what they were um, reporting, the top five health complaints that people were associating with noise was difficulty sleeping, anxiety and stress, headaches, lack of energy, and high blood pressure. And they describe this noise in terms that are usually associated with sea-weighted noise, things like vibration, humming, droning, um, continuous. They, they said they could feel the noise. So, and then the only other thing I wanted to say about this slide is it was, there was a dramatic decrease in the complaints once flowback started. So just right after the end of um, hydraulic fracturing and the pulling of the tubing. So now I wanna move on to some measurements of noise um, that have taken place in several states and that's summarized in this table here. And these are uh, A-weighted measures collected between 2006 and 2014. And what I'll uh, first in uh, West Virginia is where they noticed the highest levels of uh, noise around an oil and gas site during uh, the TREF traffic along an access road and during site preparation when uh, there was also a lot of truck traffic and a lot of heavy equipment in use. And then during drilling, um, the studies together are indicating that as the distance from the site increases, the sound looks like it's attenuating or going down, uh, less sound uh, traveling from the site. And then similar results uh, for the distance were also observed at the uh, compressor station. 
uh, I want you to notice here, though, that some of the highest levels uh, were recorded around the compressor station, indicating a sound around compressor stations may be um, larger than the noise around um, the oil and gas sites. And then in another study they did in Pennsylvania, they measured both indoor and outdoor noise. Once again, A-weighted noise. And what they observed in this study is that around the well site that they measured, the um, day and night, the outdoor levels were exceeding um, the WHO World Health Organization's threshold of 50 decibels. And at the um, processing plant, which was more like a compressing compressor station, they were observing that the A-weighted noise was observing the WHO levels both inside, outside and inside, although inside it wasn't very much above that um, WHO threshold. And then in an interesting study that was done in Colorado, they um, measured both C, which is shown in the lighter bars here, and A weighted noise, which is shown with the darker bars during the installation uh, with a sound, without a sound wall and with a sound wall during drilling and fracking. And these was measured 100 to 117 yards from the site. And what I want you to notice here is that the sound wall did attenuate the noise, both drilling and fracking for both A and C weighted noise. However, it did not attenuate it to below levels, threshold levels where it's expected health effects may occur. So this uh, 65 decibel level is the world, uh, um, our state regulators threshold, 55 is EPA's threshold and the World Health Organization's threshold is lower than that at 50 decibels. And in that same study, they also uh, characterized the noise. So they looked at the frequency of the sound waves. And what they found was that um, for all the phrases, the low frequency was, were the dominant octave bands with the lowest frequencies observed during production. So given that people living near oil and gas sites are concerned about noise and that uh, and their health, we conducted a study in Colorado around the development of a 22 well oil and gas site that was in a residential area from July 2017 to March 2018. And this site was surrounded by a 32 foot sound wall they, and they used an electric um, drill rig uh, to drill the wells. They were also using uh, modern low noise equipment. And prior to um, development, the operator actually assessed the noise around the area and reported A-weighted noise at 42.8 decibels and C-weighted noise at 55.8 decibels. And here's a map of the site showing what we monitored at four different locations around the site. And in each of these locations, we monitored, monitored continuously during drilling at the northeast site along the access road and at the south site, we also monitored um, during hydraulic frac sharing, flow back and into the beginning of production. At the northeast site, we had a weather station where we could uh, make wind measurements. And these are just show a couple of photos. Uh, this photo on the left over here is from the vantage point of the south site in the residence backyard. All these sites were in someone near someone's home in their backyards primarily. And you can see the, what it looked like before development, during the development and as production was starting. And then this right picture is showing our site along the access road, which was right behind the house here. And you can see uh, the sound wall in this photo. And what we did is we continuously measured A and C weighted noise with uh, Larson factory calibrated dosimeters. They were mounted on tripods to keep them 1.3 meters from the ground. Each dosimeter's microphone was oriented towards the, um, the sound wall there and it, they all had a windscreen on them. 
And then we excluded any measurements that were collected when the wind speeds exceeded 10 miles per hour. And we summarized our results by development phase. So for drilling, hydraulic fracturing, flowback and production. And then we also sum, uh, summarized our results into daytime and nighttime averages and looked, uh, compared them to both the World Health Organization's threshold and our state regulators threshold. So this table is showing uh, some summary statistics for our results for both A and C weighted noise. And uh, for A weighted noise, a weighted noise was exceeding that 50 decibel threshold from the World Health Organization at all sites except for the south and northwest site during drilling. The highest A weighted noise was measured during flowback uh, at 61.6 decibels. And the maximums were over 90 decibels. For C weighted noise, C weighted noise exceeded the state regulators 65 decibel limit um, during all at all sites during all phases. The maximum the highest levels were 82.2 decibels with maximums reaching over 107 decibels. So put, to put this into context a little bit, how often um, were these uh, sound levels exceeding the thresholds? So well what I'm showing on this, chart here is the upper chart is a weighted noise and the percentage of time that it's exceeding the World Health uh, Organization's 50 decibel limit. Uh, the blue bars are showing the south, the south monitoring site. The orange bars are showing the site along the access road. And then the lower graph is C weighted noise. And we've summarized day and night and then for each um, production phrase. And first, first take home is that over more than 10% of the time, both A and C weighted noise during all uh, phases at both sites was exceeding these limits. And then for hydraulic fracturing and into the beginning of completion at the site along the access road, these levels were being exceeded 80% or more of the time. These are similar to results that were reported earlier in West Virginia, um, where um, the site preparation and along the access road with a lot of trucks and um, construction, that a weighted noise was being exceeded uh, 80 to 100% of the time at a couple of the sites. Although their level, their percentage of exceedances during hydraulic fracturing were lower than what we measured in Colorado. And then I just, this last little bit of data I want to show you is around a um, compressor station in West Virginia. And sound level here is on the uh, vertical axis and distance from the compressor station is here on the X axis. The red uh, circles are showing indoor measurements and the green circles are showing outdoor measurements. And so the first thing you can see from this uh, slide, this figure is that as you move away from the compressor site, the noise levels drop off. But the other thing you can see that in this um, 300 to 600 meter range, most of the sites, the um, sound levels, both indoors and outdoors, are above this uh, 55 decibel EPA limit and definitely above the World Health Organization's 50 um, decibel limit for A weighted noise. So that, that concludes what I, want to pre, what I want to present. And just to summarize that people living near oil and gas well sites complain about noise and many report that the noise is disturbing their sleep and affecting their health. And that noise measurements that have been collected around oil and gas well sites as well as compressor stations in several sta states now are indicating that residents living near these sites may experience uh, levels that exceed uh, health-based thresholds during all phases of development, day and night. The noise is seems to be characterized by low frequency bands and it seems to be highest during hydraulic fracturing and possibly into flowback, 
near access roads and compressor stations. And then finally, uh, sound walls don't appear to be an effective in mitigating residential noise exposures um, to bring them below uh, health-based thresholds. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so we're gonna move now to the panel discussion. Um, I'm gonna ask the Justin and, and Tor to please turn on your cameras so we can start the discussion. And I wanna encourage the participants to um, enter questions in the, in the Q&A box if you do have questions. Great. Um, so, I, so I wanna start, with, start off with the, the general, I'll turn on my screen as well. Um, I want to I want to start off with a general question, Justin. You touched on this briefly, but but I want to talk a little bit about research recommendations to inform industry exposure and health scientists. So um, about about exposure, health, and and research to, to mitigate to mitigate sound. So um, Lisa and Tor, what kind of study would be needed to better understand the link between noise emitted from oil and gas and and health effects? And what do you see as the major um, research needs there? Um, I guess I can take take a stab at it first. Uh, I mean the, the the general standard now for for the the studies that are you know being being accounted within you know the, the evidence that the WHO, for example, in this last community guidelines for noise report in 2018, uh, you know they're, they're longitudinal studies, so they need to take uh, take place over you know a long period of time to to make sure that. You know, the, I guess it's a pretty basic premise in, in epidemiology, but you need to know that, you know, the the exposure came before the health outcome, uh, and and you know that that's challenging uh, to say to say the least in, in many cases. And uh, how exactly that could could or how realistic it is, you know, with respect to oil and gas development, I'm not sure. But then, um, you know, the the other part uh, is, do you do you really need to do that, you know, we, we know health effects start happening. We're, we're seeing certainly there's some differences by source, but you know there are some commonalities. Uh, you know, when, once you get up above that, you know, 50 decibel level, uh, and and there's a pretty clear dose response. Dose response with exceeding noise and health outcomes uh, above that. So I'm not, you know, it depends who it's who needs the evidence. I, I suppose, and 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 uh, how how much. Uh, how much of it they wanted to, to sort of mimic large scale epidemiological studies. And, and it depends, I guess, on how, how long these oil and gas well pads are in place for too. You know, are they there for a long enough time to actually cause some of these chronic health outcomes? Maybe not, but people that, you know, have some risk factors in place already, you know, th this might be sort of the, the, the stressor that, that triggers, triggers some, some severe health outcome uh, or, you know, sleep disturbance and annoyance are, are severe enough on their own. So it, it's a it's a loaded question, I guess. No, that's that's great. I would I would add that um, I guess we'd like to also understand whether the the noise that's being around the oil and gas sites and the compressor stations um, is some is different in its char characteristics and then traffic noise or airplane noise that and railroad noise, those are the most studied noise sources is from what you were presenting to her. And then um, also I think uh, we need to better understand kind of what the noise levels were before the oil and gas sites went in or the compressor stations went in, how much of the noise is attributed to those sources. Cause the studies right now have kind of just measured total noise. So it's, um, so I think as far as moving towards some mitigation and things of that nature, it'd be good to understand those. I think we could do some uh, studies um, where we could actually you know, do measures on people, some uh, blood pressures or other cardiovascular indicators or sleep. We can measure sleep me metrics or survey them um, and measure noise at the same time. So we could start to do some things. But I think uh, Tor's point that you know we do have a lot of information now on noise around traffic and airlines and railroads that are indicating that you know there are health effects and sleep is disturbed. So, 
Um, I, I just have a follow up question. So, so before, you know, my own reading on noise research, I kind of thought you could just piggyback on air pollution research and throw a co-located a noise monitor with, uh, with an air pollution stationary monitor. And I'm wondering if, if Lisa and Tori could talk about some of the differences between noise exposure assessment and air pollution exposure assessment. What are some of the challenges in, in doing noise research as compared to um, air pollution exposure and epidemiology research? Uh, I can, I, I've actually done some of this or I've, I've co-located a lot, a lot of uh, noise and air quality monitors and uh, correlations are, you know, they vary a bit, for, but they're usually sort of like point, point 0.3 to point 0.5 uh, kind of thing. There's significant differences in, in, in the characteristic, obviously, of the, of the, of the stressor. Uh, and I think we're, you know, in the last few years, maybe the last decade or so, <clears throat> starting to pay more attention to this in the research community. And actually, a lot of the recent studies now have, have come out to um differentiate those those health effects whereas before it's quite possible actually that a lot of health outcome not a lot but a small portion at least of the health outcomes attributed to air pollution in cities were actually caused caused by noise because they weren't controlling for noise exposures in in most of the uh, air quality studies up to date uh, to to date at least it's becoming more more common now Oh, sorry, just uh, so are they including noise as a confounder or as a uh, modifier? So, what's the way that noise is being incorporated into these studies? As a covariate, co and you know, it depends on, you know, I guess now a lot of the studies are sort of look, looking at both, uh, but you know, the, the early studies, the good, the good ones, I would say, would, would have just included uh, noise as a potential confounder, but you know, now we're, we're starting to. Parse, parse it out a bit better, and then also the better access to um, physiological data, like these these you know uh, inflammation markers that you know you can do panels now for a few hundred dollars and get a very complete picture of you know biological stressors in people's bodies that just weren't available uh, that that long ago, and you can actually buy those start sort of parsing out you know which how which is which type of stress is caused by air quality, which is caused by by noise uh, throughout the body. Thanks. Um, Lisa, I don't know if you if you wanted to, to okay. Um, so J Justin, you talked very briefly about some some research needs and I, I wonder if you could just elaborate a little bit more on that on that last slide that you that you had up. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I um I think that um might factor in a little bit to, to some of what Lisa and Tor were saying too, is just kind of a the connection to other other factors that affect um, specifically annoyance. And I think that's where we spend a lot of our time um, as consultants in the complaint space. So so usually the data set that we have is is kind of inherently biased towards the complaint situation. And whereas we don't gather data if there's no complaint. Um, and um, so part of the correlation between how sound and annoyance um, factor in and also how other factors um, play a role as well. We've got some, some solid advancements in measurement technology now. So we can look instead of a single number, we can look at the whole data set um, and not just the measurement capability, but also the data analytics capability. Um, to throw some some machine learning or AI at that um, would be quite valuable, I believe, because we can pull the insights out. But the, I believe the existing data set is is kind of more towards reaction reacting to complaints, whereas a, a, a data set that's 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 more general, uh, specifically with oil and gas, um, that's not necessarily focused on just data that was collected because of complaints, but it's data that's collected because of for the based on sound so that's one one aspect that might tie in and the other piece is the environmental propagation so as policymakers set policy as as operators plan how the, how the resource will be developed we're finding that that a pretty big risk factor is what the propagation characteristics are of the of the sound it's very site specific from what we're finding 
And a lot of the, the tools and models and methods that were developed to kind of simulate that ahead of time to proactively were based on studies, large scale studies that were done um, through the 90s, um, uh, even as far back as the 80s. Um, and taking those some of those validation studies for the propagation side of things and looking with using modern technology to get the full spectrum and also the, the temporal uh, characteristics plus throwing some data analytics to it. I believe we could come with come up with some, some stronger tools to help planning and policymakers um, to kind of create what's um, a, a better way to parse out the factors that can be controlled or mitigated versus just looking at single numbers, single kind of large stroke numbers. So those are the two areas that are really interesting to me that how annoyance is factored in and also how the propagation, um, kind of a modern look at the propagation effects. Um, so, so I'm going to ask a question from um, one of our participants. This was um, during your talk, <clears throat> Lisa. The, the question was, what, what is the role of vegetation in some of the measurements that were, um, some of the measurements that you described in your research? Um, I think all, maybe also such as forests and plains, for example, so land use and characterizing or um, the noise measurements that you took in your research. So, so in the uh, study we did in Colorado, the um, kind of the scenario was there wasn't a lot of vegetation. There was some, some uh, few trees in the yard, but we tried to get that microphone at the sound wall. So we don't know how much those trees might have mitigated any noise exposures at the at a point in the residence. But I think it's um, and then some of the measurements I know that were taken in West Virginia that those were in some forested areas or they were measuring those. Um, I, I think the vegetation and the plains, and this might go to Justin, might have more to say about this, um, probably have a lot to do with how the noise propagates. Um, so that environmental aspect of the noise and um, whether, you know, I would imagine vegetation, how close it is to the site is gonna make a big difference. Um, but Justin, can you speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, I, 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 this whole this this area is is quite fascinating to me because it, it really affects how we how we do our work, we do, whether it's doing compliance testing or also doing kind of helping helping producers pre plan something. Vegetation matters on kind of both events. So on the on the measurement side of things, um, trees can large, and we usually use a rule of thumb if it's 100 feet of trees, it can it can help with propagation, it can reduce propagation, actually cause a barrier effect, unless we're in a condition where the sound is wrapping over that, that grove of trees, uh, just like a noise barrier. But the interesting thing that we found, and, and it's, uh, is that if it's a, if it's a deciduous tree and the, the there's leaves in the yard or, or trees in the yard with leaves on them, the slightest gust of wind creates creates sound and I'm not going to call it noise because I don't think many people will call it, call trees wind blowing through trees is noise it's sound but it's energy that has to be considered and parsed out it has a great effect on kind of that contamination aspect when we're trying to do source attribution um, and the proximity of the trees there but then the leaves fall off in the winter and it's a different story it changes again sound or trees in the yard close to a measurement device also affects how the uh, sound or sorry how the wind velocity and direction there's eddy currents and things like that it affects propagation a great deal um, so there's two aspects the uh, the propagation side of things and foliage matters um, so does ground absorption so does snow so does the ground type those are all site specific factors that with um, enough data um, and enough kind of understanding of the characteristics can be planned and, and factored into the mitigation plan. Yeah, so I actually have a follow-up question for, for Tor then. So it has, has vegetation and other land use characteristics been incorporated into ex noise exposure assessment or noise modeling? And, and can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, I've been, been part of some studies recently that found uh, negative effects, I guess, of uh, vegetation on uh, on noise levels, which is positive, of course, it's good. Uh, but it's a bit tricky to parse out whether that's really because of land uses, so that, you know, wherever you have more trees in a city is generally where you might have less production of, of noise anyway. Uh, and, and as, as Justin was saying, you know, we, we do know from experimental studies uh, 
pretty well, you know, how much uh, or what kind of density is needed in vegetation over a certain distance to actually make a significant impact on, on the propagation. There are actually quite a few studies in more of the soundscape part of the, the literature that I uh, don't have enough time to be involved with, I would like to, but uh, they're, they're finding some interesting associations between perceptions though and, and green space in, in cities and, and potentially might be more on the sensitivity side of, of things um, where you know pe people expect more quiet spaces in a park so they seem to have a more you know high, higher levels of annoyance with constant noise levels when when vegetation actually might might be present and not physically doing anything to the sound but more so doing doing something to their perceived environment interesting thanks um so, so I want to talk a little bit about um, how noise management has changed. And Justin, this is um, a question for you. You know, what, what changes you've observed in noise management in the last 10 to 15 years? And how has noise mitigation evolved to address community concerns, especially since much of your work involves responding to, to community complaints? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a cool topic. And it, it's, it's part of the, the whole how uh, how data can be used to, to to evolve over time or innovate over time, and so over the past uh, couple decades, we've seen we have seen a change in how sound is managed um, in the oil and gas space. And then from a we used to deal a lot with noise complaints from from production facilities, from compressors, from permanent facilities, where sound wasn't really considered as part of the design um, through the eighties and nineties. Um, but with data, um, that the data, the ability to say whether or not the noise is coming from a fan or a muffler or an engine casing or a pump, um, being able to parse that data out through technology techniques helped, helped create a spur on innovation or continuous improvement in that space. So companies can then make decisions based on data and whether it's purchase, purchase a different muffler, purchase a slower fan. The thing that we've discovered, however, is that there's a limit to how fast that can can advance. And the limit is a fairly practical one because all of this stuff is there for a reason. There's a there's a function behind a compressor or a, a drill rig. There's a there's a purpose to it. And most noise mitigation that we see has some sort of knock on effect, uh, meaning if we we can make a, a, a fan quieter by slowing it down, but then it doesn't produce as much horsepower, uh, meaning that we had need more compression and more noise. So there's a balance. Of all of that. What we're seeing is though that 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 innovation because of the the, the data being gathered and the interest in kind of being proactive about about mitigation has resulted in a continuous evolution. We're starting to see it happening on the portable equipment too. Um, the the limit, the physic, the limitations because of the physical constraints, the portability is where we're seeing the, the biggest problem right now or obstacle, I guess, to that innovation, that growth. We know the information, we know where the sound is coming from, but actually mitigating it is is at the edge of, of what's currently available. So being able to accelerate that through data sharing uh, would be valuable. If I got most of the question, it, it's evolved in a few different ways. Um, and the other piece is, and it's just a side note, is that the ability to actually gather that data through measurements and, and new, less expensive equipment has drastically increased in the last few years. We're seeing the ability to kind of pull those insights out faster, um, better, with less, less research is, is accelerating, which is cool. Um, so we have an, another question from um, from a participant who who described that um, that um, a, a sound will help the shadows open up further away for um, oil and gas. I think you can all see this question here. Um, but except that the experience was that noise. This is um, a question from Jean Lim. Um, was that noise was a health impact further away on a hill and not at the same elevation as I assume as um, the the well site. Um, this is happening again with a new operator and they're asking whether you have any suggestions for this situation. Um, and I think, I, I guess this um, is probably for Justin, um, any mitigation suggestions? 
that it's it's really difficult to comment on very specific cases because what we've discovered is that the, the the generalities are very difficult to to form so i can't comment too much about about specifics i know that geography geometry matters a fair bit um and so does site specific factors um in in the mitigation piece um okay thanks and so we're, we're almost at time um this has been a, a really interesting discussion and i have certainly learned a lot about noise and noise mitigation how noise is measured and hopefully some some interesting research can come out of the, the insights that you all presented today um, i'm just going to sh share my screen um, quickly Um, so, so we'll make um, this webinar available for those who are not able to attend on our website in the coming weeks and stay tuned for announcement of future webinars. And there will be a survey that pops up on your screen um, as you exit the webinar and that you'll also receive by email. I also want to have, um, thank the, the speakers. Thank you so much for, um, for talking today. And um, we, we, I learned a lot and um, all of your talks were really interesting. So. Um, and thank you to the participants for attending and please um, join our, our webinars in the future. Thank you.